Testing, testing. Okay. Uh, just a few things. Oh, my speaker is. Hello, testing. Okay. So just a few things. Uh, I want you guys to, okay, if possible, turn on your webcam also because like this, I feel like I am, I don't know, that, that, that's one of the bad things about teaching online. It feels like talking to a wall sometimes. So if, if possible, turn on your webcam also because I'll be asking questions. Uh, I have to ask questions and I need you guys to answer also uh, because part of learning the topic is about me asking questions to facilitate discussion. Yes, thank you for turning on. Yes. Okay, so anytime I ask a question, right? Okay, try to answer as well. Just treat it as if it's uh, in an in-person lesson. Yeah, okay. So I can't, I can't just talk about the stuff. I, it can't just be a one-way traffic. Lah. Okay, it'll be quite ineffective that way. Yeah, okay, so if... Possible, just try to answer any questions that I ask you guys. Okay, so in other words, uh, we're just going to try to go through one half of the chapter for the first lesson. Okay, then the second lesson today, we'll talk about another half. Okay, so anyways, I uh, hope you all have the notes also. Okay, so yeah. Halogen derivatives. Okay, we're going to start on this new topic today. And as you can kind of envision really, we are looking at halogen organic compounds. Right, okay, so there are two types of halogen organic compounds we're going to look at. These two. and these two generally, we're just going to be focusing on halogenyl alkenes for the first part of today. Yeah, okay. So a couple of examples, okay. Don't normally, we see alkenes like this, okay. But we can add in, like, let's say a halogen, like a chlorine, for example. And we can already have this thing called a halogenyl alkene. Okay, just adding a halogen there alone uh, already adds on to a lot of possible reactions. Okay, so we'll be looking at that later. Okay, anything with a halogen attached to an alkene called halogenyl alkene, quite simple. Okay, and of course, there's a couple of classifications. Naming-wise, not much for me to discuss, but the classification is quite important. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, we have discussed this before. Okay, but now we are looking at a carbon that's bonded to the halogen. How many alkyl groups are bonded to the carbon that is towards, is that's bonded to the halogen? Okay, so a few examples. Okay, later I'll give you guys some examples to write down. Okay, but other than that, let's look at a few first. Okay, like for example, we have this very common halogenyl alkene. Okay, is this considered primary, secondary, or tertiary? Just a warm up little exercise here. Oops, my mic. Okay, but anyways, yeah, okay, just take a look at this. Very simple uh, secondary halogenyl alkene you must be able to identify this as we go along the way, right? Tertiary ones will look a bit more congested. So let me give you guys an example. Try to write down all these examples also because you will see all these molecules quite commonly, in fact. Okay, so this is clearly a tertiary halogenyl alkene because this carbon here has one, two, three alkyl groups bonded to it. Okay, maybe for the first time you are seeing this right now, not very used to it yet. Okay, but eventually you will get used to it lah. Okay, uh, but just take note of a few more examples, right? Okay, there are ring examples. Okay, a lot of the times, right, ring structures can cause a bit of confusion. So I just want you guys to make a guess, right? Is this a primary, secondary, or tertiary halogenyl alkene? Okay, take a look at the ring structure. Okay, so you might have your own answer already. Okay, but this should be a secondary halogenyl alkene. Now, there are, there's, there's been confusion, okay, because a lot of people think, right, okay, you look at a carbon bonded to Br, and a lot of us will feel that the ring is considered one alkyl group. So a lot of people will say this is primary, but that's wrong. Okay, just take note, uh, alkyl groups, we are looking at the alkyl groups immediately bonded to this red color carbon that is highlighted right now. Okay, we have one alkyl group here, this is the second alkyl group. All right, so that's quite important. You shouldn't be looking at the ring as one group. You should just be looking at the number of carbons that are bonded to this carbon over here, highlighted in yellow. So ring structures in particular have caused confusion before. Okay, but just take note, count there's one, two, so it's considered secondary. Okay, so there's many, many other examples as well. Yeah, I can go on and on, but this small little exercise here is just to get you guys used to the tertiary, primary, secondary halogenyl alkenes. Okay, huh? All right. Okay, so a few examples here, we will go on along the way. But you see this next page, right? Okay, page three. Okay, there are a few examples that I need you guys to classify. Okay, now it's a bit weird because I'm supposed to be drawing this for, uh, in class on the whiteboard. Lah. Okay, but anyways, I'm just going to show you guys the examples and I will need you guys to try to classify these examples 
according to primary, secondary, and tertiary. Okay, so I just hide the box. Huh? Okay, see these compounds over here? They're all in skeletal formula, okay? And I want you guys to classify them in the correct box. So I'll just give you a bit of time here. Okay, again, this is just a small little exercise. Yeah, then we'll, once you're done with it, okay, then we'll just quickly go through. Lah. Okay? Oh, so I can't access the notes. Oh, you can't access the notes. Oh, okay. Oh, have I added you to the drive yet? I haven't, right? Uh, no. That's probably why. Can you send your email to the chat or just PM me your email? Okay, I got it. Okay, I've added you to the drive. You see whether you can, you click the link again, see if you can access. Yeah, okay, access. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> Download the student copy because that's the one where the boxes are empty. Lah. Maybe about a minute more, then I'll go through. Okay, so as you're doing, uh, the, the reason why we're doing this is because this topic, right, is actually super important to identify primary, secondary, and tertiary. Towards the half, the, the center, towards the middle of this topic, you guys will see why. Okay, primary, secondary, tertiary, right, will undergo completely different reactions. On, right, so that's why we are doing this now. Okay, I'm just going to classify this accordingly also. The ones in the notes are all, some of it is not skeletal. That's why I don't want to follow this. Okay, just follow the ones that I've drawn up here. Okay, so the first one is primary. Okay, again, just focus on the blue color carbons that I'm going to highlight. This carbon here only has one other group that's bonded to it. So it's primary, very simple. Okay, second one. Again, the ring one I just went through, secondary. This one, I just need you guys to put it down in your notes, okay, so that you don't get confused. Yet again, uh, rings are not considered one group. Uh, okay, it is you look at the carbon alone and you see that there are two alkyl groups. Okay, so that one, very important. Okay, third one is primary, quite obvious. Fourth one is secondary, could be quite obvious also. Fifth one, very congested. Okay, you can go and count also, the three. Sixth one, okay, we have a ring. Okay, the ring structure here, again, because we have an additional alkyl group here, it makes it a tertiary halogenal alkene. Yeah, okay, just classify this appropriately. Okay, then we can just go on from here. Now. Okay, Ken? Any Anything you want to clarify? If, if there's anything, just interrupt. Yeah, okay, just, just mention, just unmute and just tell me. Okay, if not, I'm just going to assume everything's fine and let's just move on from here. Okay, um, okay uh, let's see page. Page four, there's nothing much for me to go through, okay, because halogenoarenes is, as you can already guess, there's a halogen bonded onto a benzene ring. And the naming and all that, I'm not really going to go over the naming because benzene, chlorobenzene should be quite obvious. This one, very small part of the topic. Lah. So that one we'll discuss towards the very end of the topic, if not now. All right, okay, then we can just move on to page five. Okay, let's take a look at page five here. 
Okay, there are some physical properties that we need to look through. Uh, and again, this serves as a revision for chem bonding. All right, so a lot of these kind of things here are okay, very important also. Okay, so first of all, when we look at a halogeno alkane, let me just draw a random one over here. Okay, let's identify our structure and bonding because remember a lot of questions are, they like to ask what's the structure and bonding of something and then you explain like the boiling point and whatnot. Okay, so again, you must classify this. One mark for structure, one mark for bonding. Okay, so what is the structure of a halogeno alkane? <clears throat> any, any, any guesses? Okay, what's the structure of a halogeno alkene? Okay, this is unimportant, huh? Okay, so any anyone want to try? Simple molecular. Yes, correct. Okay, just tell me simple molecular or simple covalent. Very important because a lot of the times, uh, if you want to make a smart guess, right? Simple molecular will probably work, right? Okay, because most of our compounds in organic chem, especially, we're going to be discussing simple molecules. Okay, how about bonding? Okay, bonding is where it's a bit more tricky. So I need you guys to just take a guess, okay? What is the intermolecular forces right in this compound over here? Just make a guess. There may be more than one. Okay, so is that important? Right? Uh PD, PD, and ID, ID. Okay, good. But... Okay, so there you, you mentioned multiple. Okay, why do you okay? First of all, why do we mention PD PD? Because it's polar. The CL okay, message. yes. Okay, you can see a polar CCL bond. That's definitely true. Okay, but before I move on to the second answer that you said, which is correct also, a lot of people think that halogeno alkanes are just PDPD because this is their logic. The halogeno alkane is overall a polar molecule and you're not wrong, right? That's why they say it's just PDPD. But remember, okay, the halogen, right, is only making up a very small part of the entire molecule. So you imagine this, uh, if just a small little bond here is polar, you have to also realize that a majority of the molecule is, in fact, non-polar, right? So if it's non-polar, a majority of the molecule also has IDID -ID attractions. And just take note, uh, this is how it describes the non-polar part of the molecule. We call that a non-polar alkyl chain, right? Then you specify that this is held by IDID -ID attractions. So yes, there are actually two interactions in this compound. And you must acknowledge this now because later on, right, we we'll look at some questions where you might choose PDPD sometimes, but other times you might choose IDID. So, okay, it really depends. Okay, but write both of these down and specify what is responsible for each intermolecular force. Okay, so we have this law. Can I? Right. Okay, then with that said, we can just move on to some very typical chem bonding questions. Lah. Okay, so first one, explain why halogeno alkanes have a higher boiling point than alkenes. Okay, but first of all, highlight these few words, uh, similar MR. Okay, let's break down what this means. What does it mean uh, when the question says with similar MR? What are we unable to compare? There's something we cannot compare if they specify this. What can we not compare? Let me guess us. Any idea? Okay. Similar MR, okay, means the size of the molecule is the same, right? So remember, every time we discuss intermolecular forces, every time we compare boiling points, you must always compare electron cloud size first, right? But in this context, if they say the size of the molecule is similar, that means we cannot compare the electron cloud size. So again, since our primary basis for comparison doesn't work, we need to find something else that works. So let's just look at a simple example here. I'm just going to take out this halogenal alkene. Okay, this is C3H7Cl. Okay, and they are saying that this guy, right, okay, is actually higher boiling point than C4H10, for example. Now, notice how I didn't use the same number of carbons uh, because I'm trying to make it such that they have similar MR. Okay, so the Cl alone already gives a lot of size to the molecule. But why does that make sense? Okay, how does this guy have a higher boiling point than this one? If we can't compare the size, then we can compare the fact that this is polar, this is non-polar, right? Okay, so that's the answer here. Look. Okay, you just have to tell me that this guy here is polar, held together by PDPD -PD attractions. This guy, alkanes, are non-polar, held together by IDID -ID attractions. So you compare the strength. PDPD -PD is stronger and hence requires 
more energy to overcome. Okay? So sometimes it's all about finding the correct reason. All right? So we, we can't compare IDID. It's fine. You can use something else to compare. Okay, again, this one just jot down in point form. Uh, just keep, write down all these keywords, Can really. I don't want to spend too much time with the phrasing and whatnot. I think that one, you're okay. All right? Okay, then there's uh, no questions. We just move on. Okay, if I if you need to copy this, tell me also. Okay, but anyways, next one is homologous series. Okay, so halogeno alkanes have higher boiling point down the whole homologous series. How and why? Okay, so first of all, I hope you all remember uh, homologous series is when the number of carbons actually increases one by one. So one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, halogeno alkanes, so on and so forth. And what happens when you go down the homologous series? We know that the this time around, uh, the electron cloud size actually increases, right? And since it increases, okay, the electron cloud becomes more easily polarized. So this is a very standard question. Uh. I don't talk about PD, PD here. It's only ID, ID because this is about electron cloud size. So you can tell me the ID, ID attractions become stronger, which require more energy to overcome. Very standard explanation here. Okay, again, when these kind of questions come out, right, you're expected to get a mark. Okay, this one is really very simple. Okay, we've done this multiple times. Okay, so that's the keyword. Okay, if there's nothing, I'm just going to move on to more important uh, examples. All right. Okay, let's move on to the fourth one. Okay, so uh, let me just break down this question very quickly. Okay, I know there's a whole bunch of words there. Okay. They're saying, right, iodo, bromo, chloro, fluoro, alkenes with the same alkyl chain. Okay, so let's just join this little diagram. Uh. Iodo alkene with two carbons, higher boiling point than bromo alkenes, higher than Cl, higher than fluorine. Our job is to explain this trend. Okay, a lot of the times uh, you're not required to predict the trend. They will tell you the trend and you're supposed to choose something that can fit this explanation. Okay, guys, we talked about just now. Uh, Halogenal alkanes are both polar and non-polar, right? So what should we be using here to discuss? Based on this trend, should we be talking about PDPD or IDID? IDID. -ID. Okay, why IDID? -ID? Okay, let's talk about why it's not PDPD. -PD, uh. Okay, so again, uh, when we look at PDPD -PD attractions, we must look at the polarity of the molecule. And if you notice, uh, out of these four bonds here, which one has the highest polarity? Carbon bonded to? Which one? I. Okay. Yeah, no, highest no, no. polarity is it to I? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, ah, okay, it should be no, F. No, uh. no, okay, yeah. F is the most electronegative. So by right, uh, this guy is supposed to be the most polar. But let's continue this train of thought. Uh. If it's the most polar, right, that means he does have the strongest PDPD -PD attractions. On the other hand, this guy here, least polar, he has the weakest PDPD. So do you notice, right? Even though you're not conceptually wrong, right? You just can't use this explanation here because it just doesn't explain the trend. So you just have to choose something that works. Okay, this answer here in blue, uh, it's not wrong at all conceptually, but just don't use it here. If this PDPD doesn't work, again, uh, we already mentioned that you must discuss electron cloud size first, not the polarity of the molecule. Okay, iodine being the largest, okay, meaning again, it's the same explanation as before. Okay, from iodine all the way to fluorine, the electron cloud size okay, decreases, correct? Okay, let's just go according to this trend. Uh, we go this way. Electron cloud size decreases. It becomes less easily polarized. And because of that, the IDID strength decreases, requiring less energy to overcome. Okay, again, very standard explanation. Okay, it's all about looking at the trend and just finding something that works. Okay. Okay, all good. Okay, with that said, uh, I'm just going to move on from here. Okay, now solubility. Okay, this one more important. Okay, and a bit more difficult to answer. Okay, so you should already know how solubility works generally, but I'm just going to draw in a diagram as well. 
Now again, uh, most of the time, you're not asked to predict whether something is soluble or not, unless it's something very obvious. Okay, but let's look at this. Uh, they say they are generally insoluble in water. Again, I like to draw in this diagram. I suggest you do too. If we have a halogenal alkene, okay, we also have halogenal alkenes holding each other, right? So we also have water holding other water molecules. So they are separate at the moment. But then right now, uh, if you try to mix them together, I have this blue color interaction that is formed between the two molecules. So again, I remember solubility is all about the blue color being strong enough to overcome the existing red color interactions. Okay? But if they say that it is insoluble, that means these blue color interactions are just too weak to break apart the existing interactions. And our job here is to first identify the interactions. Lah. Okay, so let's quickly identify this. Okay, water, very simple. We all know it's hydrogen bonds. Already very strong, lah, so very difficult to break. But how about between the halogenal alkenes? What's the interaction here that we should use? If you realize just now, uh, you can either use PDPD or you can use IDID, right? Because we identified both of these interactions. But which one works better? Okay, so this is the, the hint. Uh, okay, remember when something is insoluble, uh, do the molecules are the molecules compatible with each other? Okay, just to divert from this a bit, uh, if you have a polar molecule and a polar molecule, most of the time they are soluble. If you have a non-polar molecule and a non-polar solvent, it usually means they are soluble as well. But the final case is if you have a polar molecule and a non-polar molecule, most of the time, uh, this one doesn't actually work. They are not soluble with each other. So in general, right, solubility is just one thing. Uh, okay, You just have to keep this in mind. Okay, when they have the same nature, they will mix. If they have opposite natures, they don't mix. Okay, it's all about whether they're favorable or not. So based on this idea, let's just see. Uh, we are trying to make it such that it is insoluble. Insoluble means we're probably going to have opposing natures. So if water here is a polar molecule, that means the, this one should be a non-polar molecule, right? Okay, because I'm just going based on my answer here. They say it's insoluble. So what should we be using here? Should we, using, should we be using PDPD or IDID? If we already identified that we are talking about the non-polar portion, then we must use IDID. Law. Okay, so here, this interaction in red here should be the IDID attractions between the non-polar alkyl chains. So if you take a look over here, what's the interaction between a halogenal alkane and water? Okay, so this one, right? Okay, this one, a little bit more flexible. You can mention two different answers. Here, right, the blue color one, you tell me PDPD or you tell me IDID is fine, but I suggest you guys stick to IDID because we already mentioned that we are using the non-polar part of the molecule to interact. Non-polar and polar, not compatible, so use IDID instead. So this is an acceptable answer. Okay, can. So let's just write down the full explanation in words. Okay, this time I'll go through the full explanation because it's quite important. Okay, so first, energy release. Where do you release energy? Okay, you release energy when you form the interactions between the two guys, right? So you just mentioned no? energy release from the ID attractions okay, between the halogenal alkene and water. And because it's insoluble, you must use the word insufficient, right? It's insufficient to compensate. Okay, then so on and so forth. Energy compensate. Oh, sorry, compensate for the energy required. Okay. When do you require energy? Is to break the bonds, right? So energy required to break the IDID attractions. Okay, and I specify where the IDID attractions are. I say the IDID attractions in the non-polar alkyl chain of the halogenal alkene okay, and the hydrogen bonds in water. Okay, I'm sure you've done this explanation multiple times before, but let's just do this as a final recap. Okay.
Okay, for the following example, I'm just going to do the same thing, but the explanation you all write yourself. Okay, because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Okay, but any questions so far? Okay. Uh, draw the diagram in as well. Okay, that's quite important. Oh, good, huh? <clears throat> okay, the well, same thing for the next one. Okay, but on the other hand, uh, halogenic alkenes are generally soluble in non-polar organic solvents. Okay, so a very common non-polar organic solvent, we're going to talk about CCL4. Okay, very, very commonly used. Okay, and again, I want to draw in the diagram, the explanation you all right now in your own time. Okay, first of all, I have a halogenic alkene and I have CCL4. Okay, so let's just interact with each other first. Okay, and then the blue color interactions between both molecules. Okay, again, our job is to identify the nature of the molecule first. So if they are generally soluble with each other, that means their nature has to be the same, right? Okay, and if they already specified non-polar organic solvents. So if CCL4 is non-polar, which part of the halogeno alkane should we be using here? We should also be using non-polar, right? Such that they are compatible with each other, then they can dissolve. Imagine you chose the polar portion. The polar portion, which is the CCL bond, is not compatible with the non-polar organic solvent. Then that one just wrong already. Okay, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so they have to be compatible with each other. Okay, both non-polar. All right, then from there, I will answer very simple. This one should be IDID. Non-polar, so it's also IDID. But remember, uh, this is the non-polar alkyl chain specified. Okay, and finally, what's the interactions formed across the two molecules? If they are both IDID attractions, oh, sorry, if they are both non-polar, that means it has to be IDID attractions, right? Okay, so in this case, uh, it's, a very, it's very favorable. Even though IDID alone is very weaker, in this context, it's favorable because both molecules are non-polar. Okay, so yellow. Just have to write down this explanation, same as what we did above. Okay, but just drawing this diagram. Explanation, just write it on your own time. Right? And from there, we're just going to move on to the next one. Okay, so, so far, so good. Huh? Right, now we're going to move on to the final. Okay, at long last, okay, the organic portion of this topic. Okay, so chem bonding stuff out of the way. Okay, let's look at this. Huh? Okay, so I want you, to, you guys to highlight the word synthesis. Okay, so synthesis in all organic topics. Huh? Okay, um, again, I mentioned the previous, in the previous chapter that as you go on to learn more organic topics, you will see a lot of different reactions, a lot of different reagents and conditions. That's why, right, you must start to compile a list, right? Okay, maybe like in one word document, you're going to compile a list of all the different reactions so that you don't lose track because every topic, we're just going to introduce more and more, right? Okay, so first of all, you will see two different things. Lah. The first word you will learn is called reaction. The second you will learn is synthesis. They are kind of opposites of each other. Okay, now we look at synthesis first. Later, we look at reaction. So what does synthesis mean? Okay, synthesis, okay, it's like to synthesize something is to make something, right? Okay, to form something or to make a compound. So what am I trying to say for, about this? Okay, if we are trying to synthesize halogenal alkanes, it means uh, the reaction pathway will look something like this. From something unknown, we are trying to get ourselves a halogenal alkane. And usually, uh, these reactions are reactions that we have learned before. Okay, as you can kind of see over here already. Some of these reactions we actually learned before. So that is the pretty much how the reaction pathway should look like. So if they ask you to synthesize something, uh, you must go from the back to the front. Okay, but then how about reaction? For reaction uh, is what this guy can react to form else. What else? Okay, what else he can react? Okay, so it's about reacting further. So in a more specific context, what we mean is halogenal alkanes 
can react to form other things that we have not learned yet. Right, okay, that's why later on, then we'll be looking at reactions. Now, this thing here sounds, it just looks very superficial, right? But it's actually very important because you need to recognize, right? You need to split reactions into reaction and synthesis so that you don't get overwhelmed by the sheer number of reactions that you're about to learn. Lah. Okay, you will learn a lot and this will help a bit. Okay, so there's a list over here. I'm just going to write down all the stuff. Okay, it can be found in the next few pages, right? But I suggest you all just write this down at the bottom of page eight. Okay, quite a bit of space. Okay, so first, uh, as I mentioned, the main portion for today is halogeno alkenes. Okay, what are some ways to make halogeno alkenes? So I want you guys to think back to all the, all the different topics that you've learned before. Okay, we first learned alkane trend. Is there a way to make halogeno alkenes from an alkene? Yes, yeah, right. Okay, so first, give me the name of the reaction, free radical substitution, FRS for short. Okay, we have, a, let's say, an alkane that looks like this, right? Remember the balance equation, huh? We will form something like this. Okay, and then, of course, HCl is a byproduct. Okay, but remember, in FRS, there's a very, very important condition that you need to fulfill. Okay, so remember your UV light also. So that's your reagents and conditions. You must recognize this. Uh, UV light will definitely point to free radical substitution. Okay, but just highlight one thing that's very important. Uh, FRS is a bad reaction. Okay, FRS is not a good reaction in a lot of scenarios. So if let's say there are other better options out there, we would never really use FRS one. Okay, why? FRS is bad, right? Because it's difficult to control two things. Okay, it's, diff it's difficult to control the extent and position of substitution. Okay, what do I mean by this? Okay, this is very important also. Extent and position. Extent refers to the fact that it could undergo multi-substitution, right? And that's not what you want. If you just want to substitute one halogen, then you don't want this to proceed any further, right? But there's nothing really right to control whether it goes further or not. Okay, it's very difficult to control how much it substitutes. Because as long as there's a hydrogen, you see all these places here, all of hydrogen, right? As long as there's hydrogen, it will likely undergo substitution. And another one is position. Because uh, what are you to say that the chlorine will substitute on the first carbon? Why not on the second carbon, right? Okay, another possible structure is like this. And we can't really control the position because remember, uh, in alkanes, we learned that these two products are formed based on chance. Okay, this guy probably has a higher chance of forming or this guy has a higher chance. And then you just have to pray, right, that you get what you want. That's why it's not a very good reaction and we don't use it very often. Okay? And because of that, there are better reactions out there to make halogeno alkenes. So the second reaction I'm going to talk about is in your next topic, alkenes, la, electrophilic addition. Okay, so remember, if we take an alkene here, and we try to, let's say, add HCl, we will get this product. Okay, another way to synthesize halogenal alkenes. Okay, and remember, this one is actually a lot better. It's a much better reaction. But you may be asking me, what if the Cl substitute here instead? Isn't it very difficult to control the position as well? Right? Not exactly. Uh, because remember, we have something that can help us. If you can remember your Marconicles rule. Okay. If you, don't if you don't remember what Marconicles rule is, okay, it is formation of the more stable carbocation. Okay, remember the more stable car carbocation, right, is the one that is more likely to form. So we can actually predict the product that we want, right, a lot better as compared to FRS. FRS is just a game of chance. If you're lucky, you get your product. If you're not lucky, you won't get your product. But for electrophilic addition we know that the more likely product to form is the one that's more stable. So we can use that to our advantage, right? To synthesize what we want. Okay, that's why electrophilic addition is always a better option. Just take note of this, okay? Now, there's a third reaction also, but we have not learned this reaction yet. It is kind of like a backdated reaction, okay? It's from a few topics ahead of us. We call this nucleophilic substitution, okay? And we're just going to take this compound and alcohol, and we're undergoing substitution, right? to form back my halogenal alkene, okay? To form halogenal alkene, I just undergo a substitution. Again, these are not very important now. Okay, you don't need to know this now because we haven't learned yet, okay? So in other words, we are pretty much just know uh, there are only two ways 
to synthesize halogen alkenes. As of now, it's very simple because we only learn like two or three topics before this. But after we learn the whole organic syllabus, right, you're just going to be like, wow, shit, there's so many other reactions to make halogen alkenes. That's just going to be a lot harder. Okay, so now it's still considered fine, huh? But after we are done with that, okay, let's just look at halogeno arenes very quickly. Then we'll touch on that in the later half of today, right? So a halogeno arene is simply a how do you make a alkene? Sorry, how do you make an arene with a halogen bond onto it? Okay, what reaction is this? Okay, in fact, uh, there's only one reaction that we learned, right? Okay, the last lesson we learned of electrosub. So electrosub is the only way you can make an halogeno arene. It's reactions like these uh, that make life a lot easier because you don't need to remember so many things. Okay, so remember, uh, you just add your Cl2, and then this is a simple substitution reaction. But take note of the conditions. Okay, remember, you need to add your catalyst, AlCl3. You also need to warm the compound. Okay, so that is your electrophilic sub. Okay, okay we learned this last lesson. This is the only way to make halogeno alkenes, uh, halogeno arenes, sorry. Okay, so in other words, synthesis is not very hard uh, because it's stuff that we have learned before. When I move on to reactions, uh, it is things that we have not learned before. Okay, so any questions you want to clarify here? Okay, just copy first. Hey, I know all this can be found in the notes. Uh, okay, but just write it down so that you have a better impression. Okay, now I'm just going to move on to the meat of today's topic, right? Okay, so uh, skip past all these pages because it's whatever I just discussed. Okay, go all the way to page 14. Okay, now we're going to look at this big word over here, reactions. Okay, so again, reactions of halogenyl alkanes, meaning what can halogenyl alkanes further turn into? Right, so these are new stuff. Huh? There are only two reactions, in fact. The main one is nucleophilic sub, then afterwards elimination. Okay, so remember, uh, every time we see a very nice, very, very complicated name like this, we have to break it down first. You, I, I don't want you guys to just accept, oh, substitution, substitution law, right? Okay, so hey, don't remember it like this. You must know why halogenyl alkanes undergo substitution and not addition. Okay, so remember, uh, substitution. You look at a halogenyl alkane now. Can you all tell me if this is a saturated or unsaturated molecule? Okay, what is it? Saturated. Yes, okay. It is a saturated molecule. Okay, so what? Okay, what is an unsaturated molecule? Okay, we know that unsaturated usually has a double bond. So let's just put an alkene for example. Okay. Saturated, full of single bonds. As you can see, uh, the carbon atom already has a maximum of four atoms around it. So if it already has a maximum of four atoms, can you undergo addition? Can you add more groups onto it? No, right? Because you're already at the maximum. So what you can only undergo is substitution law. So whenever you see reactions that, whenever you see functional groups that undergo substitution, it's because they are saturated. How about unsaturated compounds? You have less than a maximum of four atoms, right? So if you have less than a maximum, you can add more things to it, right? That's why unsaturated molecules undergo addition. Anytime there's a double bonded compound, right? Double bond functional group, it will undergo addition. Okay, the only exception to this unsaturated and saturated thing is for benzene. We recalled last lesson, uh, benzene is pretty much made, made out of double bonds, correct? So if benzene is just made out of three double bonds like this, shouldn't it undergo addition, right? No, it doesn't. Okay, benzene is the only exception uh, where it undergoes substitution, but not addition. We have already gone through the reason why. Uh, because benzene is such a stable compound and addition will break that stability. So you don't want that to happen. That's the only exception. Other than that, from now on, you can just use this rule. Next, nucleophilic comes from the word nucleophile. Okay, what's a nucleophile? A nucleophile is defined as a what kind of species? You must know. Huh? Okay, it's also mentioned in the notes. Okay, I just realized. Okay, it's an electron-rich species. 
Okay, as opposed to the previous topic, we were looking at electrophiles. But remember, how do you identify an electron-rich species? Okay, is anything with a negative charge or anything with a lone pair of electrons but don't have a negative charge? So a few examples that you will see later. Okay, so today I'll be going over three different nucleophiles. Huh? Okay, so you can see, I'm just going to write it down now. The first nucleophile is OH minus. Second is CN minus. Third is ammonia. Now, do you re okay, how do you know that all these three guys are, are nucleophiles? Why are they considered electron rich? The first two, very obvious. They both have negative charges. And that means there will be lone pairs on the oxygen and the carbon atom. Whereas for ammonia, ammonia is neutral, okay, but it does have a lone pair also. Okay, so that's why it's still considered rich. Okay, so we'll see how this works later on. Okay. Now, so the first one is with OH minus, like what I already discussed. Okay, for OH minus, you take a halogenal alkane, you undergo OH, you react with OH minus. What's going to happen here is you will turn it into an alcohol. Okay, so take note of this functional group, uh, alcohol. OH is alcohol. Okay. Now, look at the reagents and conditions. This one is in the notes. You can use any one of these. Okay, any OH, KOH, both are fine. But remember, it's actually quite important. You must highlight this aqueous. Okay, you must specify it's in an aqueous state. Later, we'll see why. Okay. But anyways, okay, I'm going to look at the mechanism in the later half of the lesson. Okay, but as of right now, right, we won't see the mechanism yet. But take a look at why it's called nucleophilic substitution. OH- is a nucleophile. It is electron-rich. Now remember, guys, what's the movement of electrons? Is it from rich to poor or is it from poor to rich? Okay, how are the electron move? How is electron movement like? Rich to poor. Yes. Okay, it is always from rich to poor. Now this is important, huh? Because later on, we'll be looking at mechanism drawing. This guy is rich, which means this guy here must be electron poor. Lah. But can someone just tell me uh, what part about this molecule is poor? Okay, remember, uh, poor, you usually see either partial charges or full positive charges. So what part about the halogenal alkane uh, makes it poor such that the nucleophile can attack it? Any idea? This is not important. Okay, I won't give you all the answer. Let's try. Okay, any clue? You look at this molecule here. Any part about this thing that is poor, perhaps a clue will be a partial positive charge. Is there anywhere with a partial charge? Okay. Normally, you see partial charges when the molecule is polar, right? Any polar regions here have, correct? We have a polar bond. And in other words, we have a partial positive charge on the carbon that's bonded to the Cl. So based on this alone, uh, it's a sneak peek of what we're going to see later. Your lone pair on, okay, I zoom in. Uh, your lone pair on the oxygen must be shown attacking this carbon here. Okay, so we will see the movement of that electron later on. It will be a bit different from this, but this is the general idea first. Huh? I need you guys to realize how the electron movement is like. Okay, we get ahead of ourselves. Okay, so that later on is not that difficult. Okay. Okay, and with that said, okay, you just need to know the reagents and conditions, and that's pretty much it. This is quite simple. Okay, but let's go on to something a bit more than that. Okay, so I have another one. It's with CN minus. This is another nucleophile. I have Cl, yeah, I reacted with Cn minus. I'm just going to undergo a swap, a substitution. Okay, so as you can see here, I have another electron rich species, and it is this carbon here that's electron poor. Then they just attack, same as before. But I need y'all to take note of this. Uh, a lot of people think that the lone pair is on nitrogen for good reason, uh, because you see the negative charge, then you see nitrogen, then you make that guess. But actually, the lone pair here is on carbon. The carbon on the lone pair attacks this carbon here. Okay, why is that so? Because I want you all to look at the final product. Uh. Is the carbon bonded to C or bonded to N? 
it's quite clear that it's bonded to C, right? That's why it's C that has to attack this carbon over here, not N. Just take note of that. Okay. And in other words, what's this functional group called? We're going to introduce a new functional group today. It's called nitrile. Okay. Nitrile is anything with CN. Now, we have, there is no chapter in our syllabus on nitriles. We are only going to learn three reactions of nitriles today in this topic. Okay, so nitrile doesn't have a topic. Huh? It's only in this same topic here. Okay, and I want you all to take note of this. Huh? The reagents and conditions, right? Instead of N, okay, you all see this? This is NaOH or KOH. Here you use NaCN or KCN, quite obvious. But what you need to take note of, huh? you cannot use aqueous. It must be ethanolic. What is ethanolic? Okay, so remember just now, huh? aqueous means we are using water as a solvent. Ethanolic just means we are using alcohol as a solvent. And this matters. It actually matters to how the reaction goes. If you don't use the ethanol solvent, the reaction just wouldn't happen. Then can already. Can so far? And I need you all to pay attention to this part. Huh? This is where things get a bit more important. I want you all to realize something. Huh? Just go and look at the number of carbon atoms in the reactant and in the product. What do you all notice? How many carbons are there in the reactant? Just two, right? How many carbons are there in the product? There are three. Okay, do you notice this? I have successfully, uh, through this reaction, I have increased the number of carbons from two to three. In fact, it doesn't have to be just from two to three. I can have a four carbon product and I can increase it to five carbons. And that's very important for the tutorial we're going to do today because I need you all to realize this. Uh, this CN minus, right, has the ability to increase the number of carbons by one. And this is known as a step-up reaction. Very crucial idea. Okay, step-up just means you increase the number of carbons by one. Okay, but it doesn't have to be by one. Okay, sometimes you can step up by more. Then I am sure you all can guess, step-down means to decrease the number of carbons. Okay, but we, will look, we won't look at step down into this chapter yet. Okay. So this is actually, you might be wondering what's so special about increasing the number of carbon atoms. It's actually very, very useful, right? In producing bigger compounds. Later when we do questions, you all will see why. Okay, but now I need you all to look at this. Uh, I'm going to look at further reactions of nitriles. Again, uh, nitrile doesn't have a dedicated chapter, so we are just going to learn all about nitriles in this chapter. Remember, reactions means this nitrile here will turn into other stuff. So take note, uh, the first reaction here is what we call hydrolysis, but it's called acidic hydrolysis. Now, before I look at the, re before I look at the reaction and all that, uh, I want you all to remember, in the context of organic chemistry, hydrolysis means you are going to use water, right? You, you think of hydro, you think of water. We are going to use water to break bonds. Okay, this is the organic definition of hydrolysis, huh? using water to break bonds. Okay? And we're going to see how this works. Okay, so I want you all to take a look at the reaction now. I have CN. Okay, and this guy hydrolysis needs water, so I'm gonna add water. Then what's this acid? The acid is just the medium, Okay, the medium, H plus, because acid. Okay, and what's gonna happen is I'm gonna produce this compound here, and I want you to write down the functional group. This is a carboxylic acid, CO two H carboxylic acid, which you have seen before. Okay, so nothing too special. Okay, but look at the other product here. Okay, the other product here, because you see the nitrile, where did the nitrile go? The nitrogen, sorry. The nitrogen here will just become NH4+. And I want you all to make some sense of the products. Huh? Don't just accept the products as if it's, oh, it's just a fact. Okay, take a look closely. Can you all see, uh, it's because this is in acidic conditions, the carboxylic acid will be an acid, obviously. Okay, but then over here, of course, it will not be ammonia. It will be the conjugate acid of ammonia, which is NH4+. Okay, it'll be clearer when I show you guys what we're going to use later on. Okay, but next, take note of the reagents and conditions. Okay, you must add an acid, preferably H2SO4. 
and then you must heat. Okay, remember hydrolysis reactions must heat. Why? Okay, any guesses why hydrolysis reactions must heat? Okay. So already mentioned, right? Hydrolysis is all about breaking bonds, correct? And we need the heat to break bonds. In this particular context, can you see you are breaking the CN triple bond? Okay. This right here has a triple bond. We have cut that off, right? Such that we can have a CO2H over here. A triple bond is very difficult to break, but apparently this reaction here is possible. And that's why you need to heat the reaction. Okay. And let's just take a look at the second reaction. It's actually very similar. I'm just going to undergo basic hydrolysis instead. So same thing, you can expect a very similar looking reaction. CN, hydrolysis need water. But now because it's basic, right? I have to add OH- minus. Can see that? Yeah. But guys, can you predict what the product is? Okay, I'm not going to draw the product yet. Go and predict. Will I get a carboxylic? Acid. Okay, will I still get a carboxylic acid? No, right? Because this is in basic conditions. So, guys, what do you think I will get here? Any guesses? Okay, it's not CO2H, but it's what? Any clue? Okay, a base. If you take the acid and you read a base, you'll get a salt right okay so you're gonna get yourself co2 minus this is no longer called carboxylate acid this is called a carboxylate salt okay of course they are the same functional group okay but call that carboxylate salt from now on okay can you guess what's the second product is it nh4 plus okay it should be what basic conditions what will you get instead nh3 Yes, good. Okay, any three. So I don't want you guys to just, why am I doing this, right? It's because I don't want you guys to just blindly go and remember. No point. Okay, you must know, you must improvise. Know, understand how the products come about. So I want you all to go and highlight the NH4 plus and NH3. Uh, and I'm going to give you guys a question now. Okay, hear me out. Uh. If I want to conduct a distinguishing test, okay, distinguishing test, which reaction should I use? Should I use acidic hydrolysis? Of basic hydrolysis. Okay, and I already told you guys to just highlight this. So the answer lies here. Okay, remember distinguishing test, I want an observation. Which type of hydrolysis will give me an observation? Okay, basic or acidic? Okay, it should be basic, right? Okay, because our guys. Ammonia gas can turn your moist red litmus paper blue. But then, right, okay, you take a look at this guy here, NH4 plus, you cannot do anything. Okay, you won't see any observations. Okay, so take note. Uh, this one, right, no observation. So if you want a distinguishing test, right, please use the basic version. Okay, so if they ask you to distinguish a nitrile, avoid the acidic version here. Okay. Right. Finally, there's only one last reaction. Okay, and this is called reduction. Okay, wait, a few things. Uh, I forgot to write the reagents and conditions for this guy. Okay, I'm sure you can already imagine. I want a base, so just use NaOH in an aqueous state and heat. Okay, but anyways, reduction. What are we looking at here? Okay, for reduction, I want you to take note of this. Okay, just write down this. I don't think you have come across this before. Okay, this is the first time you come across this reagent. Lithium aluminium hydride in tri ether. Yes, okay, word for word. Okay, you must write this whole thing out. Okay. Alternatively, we can use something that we have learned before. Hydrogen gas, nickel catalyst, high temperature and pressure. We learned this in alkenes. Both are possible answers. And what are these guys anyway? Okay, these guys here are all reducing agents. Organic reducing agents. Okay, so take, take note. Uh, 
Okay, in oxidizing agents in organic chem, it's like your KMNO4 or potassium dichromate. But here, we're going to learn some new reducing agents. Okay, you just need to write down this whole thing. You don't even need to know why it's dry. You, you don't need to know what the ether is. But you do need to know this. Lithium aluminum hydride is a reducing agent. What's going to happen here is this. Uh, I'm going to take a nitrile. N is going to turn into... Okay, I'm just going to add four H's here. You will turn into this thing. Okay, this is an amine. Okay, another functional group you will see shortly. Right? Okay, take a look at this. Uh, how did I turn a nitrile into an amine? Recognize the pattern here. I'm just adding two H's to C, two H's to N. and can see that. Very simple. Okay, add two H to C, two to N. That's it. And we can move on from here already. Okay, so far? So again, our nitriles, right? You all need to study these three reactions. Okay, there are only three reactions you're going to learn for nitriles. No more than that. Right? Okay, any further questions you all have? Okay, so we digress a bit. Huh? We talk about nitriles, but now we're going to talk about a third nucleophile. Okay, so take a look at this. Huh? Okay, this one. This one, okay, we'll spend a bit of time on it okay, because it's a bit tricky the first time you'll see this. So you'll need to follow me very carefully. Huh? Okay, but anyways, I've talked about OH minus. Very straightforward. I've talked about nitriles. Okay, now I'm going to talk about amines. Okay, I'm going to use the final nucleophile, NH3. So remember just now, uh, NH3 has a lone pair. So even though it is not, it doesn't have a negative charge, it's still a nucleophile. How does this work? Okay, first of all, uh, I'm going to take a halogen. Okay, because we're talking about halogenal alkanes. Uh, I take a NH3. And as you can guess, I'm just going to do a simple substitution. But is this correct? Okay, this is not correct. Huh? Okay, can you see why? It's because the, uh, the nitrogen here has how many bonds? The nitrogen here has four bonds, right? That's not possible. Lah. Okay, so this one's a bit different from what we saw just now. Don't just substitute. Okay, this one just has to be NH2. And if that's NH2, the, the final hydrogen, right, has come here. HCl. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this right here, anything with an NH2 is known as an amine. It's what we saw just now also. Just now here, we have turned it into an amine because of the fact that it has an NH2. Okay, now the thing is, uh, because we never really learned amines before, I need you all to follow this very closely Okay, as I go over the next portion. Okay, but for now, uh, take a look at the reagents and conditions. Ethanolic, same thing. Okay, because you need to have uh, this... Uh, solvent inside, ethanolic. Then afterwards is NH3. Now, why do you think you heat in a sealed tube? Okay, it's because the sealed tube, right, it just prevents the ammonia from escaping. Okay, ammonia is a gas. So if you want the reaction to be perfect, okay, you just have to put your sealed tube. Okay, so that, that's pretty much it for this first part of the reaction. But I want you all to take a look at this empty box. Okay, I need you all to follow me with this. Okay? There's a possibility that this guy can undergo multi-substitution. And before I start this, I want you guys, I want you guys to take note of something. I want you all to, as I'm drawing this out, I want you all to try and identify a pattern. Try to identify a pattern that can help us to answer why multi-sub can happen for this particular reaction. Okay. The previous two examples, OH minus and CN minus. There is no multi-substitution. But here, there will be multi-sub. And I want you guys to possibly find a reason why. Perhaps you find a pattern in what I'm going to draw. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to write down the first reaction again. I'm going to start off with a very simple halogenal alkene. Okay? Now, I'm going to substitute with NH3. So just follow me. I'm going to draw out NH3 also. And from what we went through just now, the Br is substituted with the NH2. And I get HBr as a byproduct. Now notice something here. 
a H and a BR will come out to form HBR. Then whatever else that isn't circled in blue will be joined together. And so far, I want y'all to circle out the H and BR also to show that it comes out. But this is only the first substitution. More substitutions can take place. And notice what's going to happen here. I'm going to take out the same halogenal alkane. But this time, instead of reacting with ammonia, I'm going to react it with the product that I just formed. This guy, the product, will undergo another round of substitution. Like this. Okay, I'm going to draw all the bonds. The yeah, same thing, uh, what's going to happen here? One H will come out and the BR will come out also. So I will still form HBR. Okay? But I want you all to try to predict. Uh, try to see how the product looks like. Okay, see this part here? I never circle it in blue. Uh. So whatever that's not circle in blue, I'm just going to draw it out again. Okay? But now... This part here is going to combine with two more carbons. So now the H is replaced with two more carbons. Okay, notice what's happening already. Huh? This product here is, the, is a primary amine. This guy here is a secondary amine. Can you all tell why? Here I have one alkyl group bonded to the end. Here, I have two alkyl groups bonded to the end. So try again. I'm, not, I'm going to draw one more time. Huh? Okay, there's another reaction. And still, uh, go and figure out what the pattern is. Okay, so next. I'm going to take out the same halogenal alkane, but I'm going to react it with the, the compound here that I just formed, the secondary amine. So let's draw it out. What do you think I'm going to form over here? Same thing, I'll still get HBR. So circle out your BR, circle out the H. Any guesses what my third product looks like now? What's it called? Primary, secondary. You go one more round, you become? That's three, right? Okay, so how does it look like? My H is gone. Okay, let's just draw this part out first. It looks like a wing, uh, like a bird. But then now, I'm going to add in another two more carbons. So notice a pattern. Uh. Organic chem is all about patterns. Okay, so let's just see what is happening here. I have only one alkyl group. Here I have two alkyl groups. Here I have three alkyl groups. All the alkyl groups have two carbons. Why two carbons? It's because that's my starting initial halogenal alkene. And guys, I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause here first. Okay, I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to pause here. Can someone just tell me, uh, what do you think the pattern is? As long as there's a what and there's a what, then you will undergo this multi-substitution. Any idea? Can see a pattern that I've been... What's the common product here? Okay, any idea? Any guesses? As long as the compounds have what and what, so the multi-sub can happen. Any, any patterns that you, you have noticed? Okay, so, and bromine. Yes, hydrogen and bromine. Okay, so that is the thing that a lot of people will say. Okay, so that, that's what I'm trying to show you guys also. Now, as long as you have hydrogen and bromine, the reaction can occur. Now, I can tell you guys uh, okay, that that is not actually correct. Because let me show you guys, uh, this reaction can go on one more time. I'm going to take out the PR again. But this time around, I'm going to take out the tertiary amine. Guys, based on the pattern that y'all have just mentioned, uh, do you think this reaction is possible? From the first three, it looks like as long as you have a H and a BR, the reaction can happen. So can this reaction happen? By right, no, right? Because there's no more H on the tertiary amine. So by right, this reaction not supposed to happen. But in actual fact, right, this reaction goes on one more time. Then. I'm going to circle out the BR. And now, right, okay? Instead of having three wings, okay, I just call these wings from now on. Instead of having three wings, I'm going to add a fourth wing to it. And when that happens, uh, nitrogen cannot hold four bonds, right? So nitrogen now will have a plus charge. And then the other product is not HBr because there's no more H, right? So it's just Br minus. This is known as 
a quaternary, which is like four degrees, okay, quaternary ammonium salt. Okay, it's not an amine anymore. Okay, this one has charges really, so this is considered a salt. This fourth reaction is what makes this segment here a bit more challenging than what it already is. So guys, is the pattern correct? As long as you have a H and PR, the reaction can happen. Is that pattern correct? No, it's not. Because clearly from the fourth reaction, you know uh, that even without a H, the reaction can still happen. So guys, if you don't need to have a H, then what do you need to have instead? This is very important. Uh. I repeat my question. Why does the multi-sub happen? As long as you have what? It's not H. It's not PR. Okay. You, as long as there is a nucleophile. Good, okay. So let's go into more detail. Huh? This is called nucleophilic sub. A nucleophile is something that's rich, right? A nucleophile that's something as, that has what? What must a nucleophile have to consider rich? Electron. It a must have pair. a lone pair of electrons. Good, okay. I need you all to write this down. Very, write down somewhere. Okay, I'm going to write down, down here in green. As long as the nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons, multi-sub can occur. It's not about having H or not. Lah. This is nucleosub. As long as you have a nucleophile, this reaction can happen. Let's look at it again. Lah. Look at the four steps again. Why does nitrogen have a lone pair? You all see the first step? Nitrogen here has a lone pair of electrons on ammonium. So the reaction can happen. The second one, the primary amine still has a lone pair. So it can still happen. And remember what we went through just now? If this is the lone pair, this is rich, right? I mean, what part about the halogenal alkene is poor? This carbon here, right? That carbon there is poor. So you all notice what's happening here. I zoom in, uh, you all see this. This lone pair is bonded to this carbon here. So you notice what's happening. The carbon here, look at my screen now, huh? the carbon here is bonded to the end. Okay? Carbon here bonded to the end. I'll do this one more time for the second reaction. Huh? Look at this. Huh? The lone pair, same thing, attacks the poor carbon. So what's happening here is when it attacks this carbon, the nitrogen forms a new bond over here. The left one is the existing bond. Uh, but now it forms a new bond with two more carbons. Repeat the same process here. Secondary amine still has lone pair. It can still attack the poor carbon. So when it attacks this poor carbon here, it has two existing bonds ready. But now it forms a third bond with another two carbons. Last but not least, the tertiary amine still has lone pair. It can still attack the poor carbon. That's why now it has four wings. Now look, can this go on one more time? How do you know this one stops here? How do you know it doesn't go on anymore? How do you know that this is the final, final compound? Why? No more lone pair. Exactly. Look at the nitrogen. How do you know he doesn't have a lone pair? Is there something there that showed that tells you very obviously that he has no lone pair? Positive? Yes. When you are positive charge, are you rich or poor? Positive means you are poor. How can you have a lone pair if you are poor? So you look at this. Uh, the nitrogen gave away his, his lone pair, the last lone pair he has. And because of that, right, he can't go on anymore. This is the final time ready. This is the last reaction. So in other words, uh, this part here, a lot of people struggle with this reaction. Because it's very, it looks very complicated. It goes on four times. But all I need you guys to know is this. Uh, the arrow movement here is quite important. Of course, it's not the full mechanism. But this arrow movement will help you all see. Uh, rich attack poor. Rich attack poor. Rich attack poor. Rich attack poor. But then now the nitrogen has no more lone pair. So poor cannot attack poor. But that's why it stops there. Okay. Any questions you all have for this? Okay, I'll try to go as slow as possible for this. Uh, okay, because quite confusing at the start. Uh. Any questions, okay? Okay, there's just maybe one more part about this and then we can end off this segment. 
Okay, so sometimes I don't want multi-sub to happen. Sometimes I just want one reaction and that's it. I don't want it to go on and spiral out of control. So how should I do that? You see here, at the start of the page, when they write here excess, Okay, excess right here is just for mono substitution, just for one substitution. But I want you all to I don't want you all to just memorize this. Okay, you all take a look. Uh, take a look at these four steps here. If you want just one reaction, should you add limited or excess ammonia? A lot of us will say limited. And I don't blame you all because you see this. Uh, limited means a bit. A bit means substitute a bit. Okay, don't write this down. This is wrong. Huh? Okay, then you all say, oh, if you want, you want multi-sub, then just add excess. Huh? Just add a lot. Huh? You add a lot so that the substitution can happen multiple times. Now, this is very intuitive. Okay, this is very intuitive. This works for FRS, but it doesn't work here. Okay, this is wrong. Huh? Let me show you guys instead. How should we know? How should we remember this? Okay, hear me out. Huh? If I want the go, if I want multi-sub, I want all four reactions to happen. Is there an ingredient right that appears in all four steps? Can you see that one ingredient that appears throughout all four steps? This thing, right? Can you see uh, the halogenal alkene appears in all four steps if you want it to undergo four substitutions? Meaning to say, if you want multi-sub to happen, you must have excess halogenal alkane. Agree? I say again, huh? if you want all four steps to happen, you need to have a lot of halogenal alkane. That's why like excess halogenal alkane. What does excess halogenal alkane mean? If this is an excess, ammonia must be limited. One or the other. If one is excess, the other must be limited. That's why uh, limited ammonia will actually give you multi-sub. Even though that's not very intuitive, right? But that's actually the case here. On the other hand, if you just want a single, a single substitution, then how? If you want mono-sub, uh, can you all see? Just limit your halogenal alkane. Don't put so much halogenal alkane, correct? So if you don't want to put so much, that means uh, your halogenal alkane must be limited. And limited halogenal alkane means vice versa, ammonia will be in excess. So in other words, uh, it's actually better if you guys use the halogenal alkane and tell me whether that guy is excess or limited. Ammonia one will be a bit more, it's less intuitive, it's counterintuitive. Okay, can see what I'm trying to say here, right? Look at this guy. Uh. If you want to substitute a lot, make sure this guy put a lot. If you want to substitute little, make sure you put very little of this guy. Yeah, that's it. Okay? Okay, and that will pretty much end off this segment here. So go and flag out this page. Huh? This reaction here, not easy. Okay, definitely not easy. Okay, Ken? Any further questions? Okay, if you don't have, okay, let's just move on from here. We have one final reaction before we, uh, we take a break. Huh? Okay, so we have already undergone nucleosub. There are three nucleosubs, OH minus, CN minus. But for CN minus, uh, we need to know the reactions of nitriles. Ammonia, we need to know this multi-sub segment. Okay, that's why it's not as easy as it looks now. Okay, now finally, we can take a look at elimination. As we said just now, there are only two reactions. One is nucleosub, the other one is elimination. And we have learned elimination before. So this one is not going to be very tough. Okay, come, let's look at this. I want you to look at the reagents and conditions again, uh, ethanolic. Because if you write NaOH equals, guys, can you remember uh, what reaction will happen if you use NaOH equals and heat? What reaction will occur instead? Any idea? Okay, from just now, uh, if you undergo, if you use NaOH equals, you end up getting a nuclear sub of OH minus. I don't want that here. Okay, that's why I need to use ethanolic. Ethanolic will favor elimination. 
Can? Okay, next. Now we went through this before. Okay, when you eliminate, right? I want you to write this down also. You must remove HBR. Oh, sorry. Not HBR, but just HX in general. Think of that. Elimination is about the removal of HX. So if you look at this overall equation here, it's very obvious. Uh, you must remove the BR. But do you remove the H? Because all these are H's, right? Can I just remove any H? Okay, look at what I'm trying to form. I'm trying to form an alkene. I'm trying to form a double bond in between these two carbons. So can I just remove this H? No, right? If I remove this H and I remove this BR, a double bond is still not going to make this carbon on the right four bonds. So take note, uh, okay, for elimination, is a very important thing. You must remove a H from the carbon beside. So go and write this down. Okay, the carbon atom that is adjacent to the CX bond must have at least one hydrogen. Okay, that's a criteria. So I'm going to give you guys one example. Okay, just draw this example somewhere. Okay, I need you all to tell me whether this guy here can undergo elimination or not. Okay, draw this structure here. Can this guy undergo elimination? You zoom in. Huh? This is the carbon with the CL. And that's why you must remove a H from a carbon beside it. The carbon beside it can only be this guy here. Does he have a H? <clears throat> no, right? So this one cannot. Lo. Okay, so just go and check. Lo. Can I? Okay, next. Now over here, they say draw a diagram to illustrate this thing called Caesar's rule. Okay, you don't need to know Caesar's rule in your syllabus. Okay, you don't even need to explain what it means. You just need to remember one thing. Okay, uh, uh don't draw anything. I just need you all to write down, write this down. Okay. Caesar's rule states that uh, the more alkyl groups bonded to the double bond, the more likely it is to form. Okay, so it's the more the better. Lah. Okay, the more alkyl groups on the double bond, the better. <laughs> okay, and we're just going to use the question on the next page. Okay, uh, this part at the bottom here, don't need to know. Okay, this one is a mechanism that is not tested in your syllabus. Okay. Okay, go over to page 19. Okay, on page 19, okay, we're going to draw the products for the elimination reaction of 2-bromobutin. Here, we will learn the Caesar's rule. Okay, so I want you guys to draw 2-bromobutin. And I'm going to give you guys like maybe a minute to go and draw the products. Okay. Okay, draw the products of elimination. I'll be back in a minute.
Okay. <clears throat> right, okay. How many products have you guys drawn? Okay, so you've drawn two products. Okay, wait, my mic is... Hello, okay. So two products, okay, because you can eliminate on both sides, right? Okay, one here, one here. So if you eliminate on the left, you will get this. If you eliminate on the right, you will get this. Now, okay, so based on CSS rule, which one is more likely to form? Okay, CSS rule says that the, this one is more likely to form. Okay, why? You want to have more alkyl groups on the double bond. So you have two alkyl groups on the double bond here. But this one, you only have one alkyl group on the double bond. So two is better than one. So this one will be more likely to form. Okay? However, there is a third product. Any idea what the third product is? Okay. So this is a very common question. Huh? Okay, they will ask you guys to draw three products for this guy here. And it's because the middle guy can undergo cis trans. Okay, the middle guy here is the trans isomer. The left guy is the cis isomer. So that alone is already two products. Okay, the one on the right, okay, cannot undergo cis trans. Okay, so it's just stand alone. Okay, now let's just explain a little bit. Okay, so they have another layer. Okay, we already know that cis and trans both have two alkyl groups bonded to the double bond, which is already more than this. So we know that this guy is definitely the minor product. But between cis and trans, who is actually the more major product between both of them? As we mentioned, we can't use CSS rule here. Because both of them have two alkyl groups. But the answer here is that actually a trans is more likely to form than cis. Any idea why? Okay, I think if you're not sure about this now, never mind. Okay, but I will show you guys the answer. And this is a common thing in chemistry also. Now you notice uh, over here, the two alkyl groups are on the same side. But the two alkyl groups are on the opposite sides. And when you're on the same sides of the molecule, it's more cramped. So let's talk about that first. Okay. The two alkyl groups on the cis isomer are on the same side of the double bond. And because they're on the same side, right? Compared to being on opposite sides, this one will face more crowdedness in that sense. Okay. And that idea there is the idea of steric hindrance. Now, steric hindrance is a bad thing. Okay, what is steric hindrance? Okay, steric just means space. What's hindrance? Okay, I'm sure you all know what hindrance is. Uh, it's like an obstruction like that. Okay, that means uh, the less space, that uh, the more steric hindrance that something has, right? It means it's more crowded. And that is not a good thing because more steric hindrance uh, will make the compound less stable. And if it's less stable, it is less likely to form. Okay. So yeah, we introduced this new term called steric hindrance. Having more steric hindrance just means uh, the molecule feels very bulky, feels very crowded, feels very cramped. And that's a bad thing. You see the trans isomer, it faces less steric hindrance because the groups are on opposite sides, so it doesn't feel as cramped and crowded. That's what steric hindrance means. Okay, so they can also, also ask you guys to explain between cis and trans, which is more likely to form. Okay, definitely possible. Any questions here? Okay, do I have, okay, good. Okay, so we have pretty much come to the end of what I'm going to go through for the first lesson. Okay, later on in the second lesson, right, then we'll talk about the mechanisms and whatnot, which are also quite huge. Lah. Okay, so we're going to take a break first. And then for the remaining of the lesson, I'm going to do some questions from the tutorial. Okay, so go and download the tutorial also.
Okay, but we take a break. Lah. Okay, we take a break until let's say 238 around there. Okay, so by 238, you can just come back and then we will do some tutorial questions. Okay, in particular, we're gonna do question four later. If any questions, you can ask me now. Okay, but uh, if not, you can chill first. Okay. Can, can. All right, okay. I'll just go through this. Okay, so this one looks a bit more challenging than before. Okay, because before that, we just identified functional groups. Okay, so we have a halo geno alkane here. So you can think of the reactions we learned today. Okay, because again, uh, this is the reaction of a halogenyl alkene. How about this one here? It's an alcohol, right? So it's the synthesis of alcohol, like what we did previously. Can we turn a halogenyl alkene into an alcohol in one step? By right, it's can, right? Because if you flip through your notes, you'll realize we can just substitute the Br into an OH. But that's not the desired product, one, right? If you realize that, uh, the OH is just not in the right position. It is on the first carbon, but I want the OH to be on the second carbon. So clearly, uh, this isn't as simple as just immediately undergoing nucleosub. There's something else at play here. So any idea what we need to do to this guy first? Okay. Good. Okay, we are trying to remove the BR because he's no longer on that first carbon. How do I remove BR? It's via elimination, right? So elimination will give me my alkene, and my alkene, the double bond will be here, because that's the only place where you can form the alkene. So take note, uh, okay, here, this is an elimination reaction. Now, you don't need to write elimination, you don't need to write the name of the reaction on your pathway, but I want you to write it down just for practice sake. Uh, okay, this elimination, and you must write the reagents and conditions. Now, reagents and conditions are, is like one of those things where you do until you get very used to it. So as of right now, I'm just going to write down the answer for that. Okay, you must use ethanolic NaOH and heat. Now, remember, don't put aqueous out of habit. Huh? If you put the aqueous here, you're contradicting the ethanolic already. Okay, so just make sure. Okay, now you got rid of the BR. Okay, good. But what's next? Can we turn this alkene into an alcohol in one step? Okay, so what do you guys do? Okay, do you add back the BR first? So you add back the BR, then you undergo nucleus sub afterwards. Okay, this one is correct, but you can actually shrink this into just like that. You don't need to do that extra step. This is actually already enough you can actually undergo electrophilic addition for an alkene into an alcohol. It's in our alkenes notes. But just remember the reagents and conditions. Now. Okay, this one you need to add steam, H3PO4 catalyst at high temperature and pressure. Okay? So if you did the previous one, you're not wrong also. Okay, but right guys, Sometimes uh, they can impose a limit on the number of steps. Like if they tell you guys you can only use two steps, that means you can only use this one step, two step. So you cannot, even though the previous answer is also correct, but that one is more than the stipulated number of steps, then that will be considered wrong. Yeah, okay, so just bear in mind. Now. Okay, but think, no, whenever you want to change the position of a BR, right? Or yeah, they are first position now become second position. You must have elimination somewhere in your market, in your pathway. Okay. Okay, guys, let's try part C. Part C, I'll give you guys like two minutes. Okay, and then I'll talk about some of the additional techniques that you can have. Okay, so I'll draw the compound for you guys out. Okay, we have this. And then it eventually turns into this. Okay, identify the functional groups. And go ahead and refer to your notes, okay, where these functional groups appear. So two minutes, okay, give this a try.
Okay. I'm just gonna go through. Okay, because I'll try more questions. Okay, for part C, right? Okay, this is where I remember asking you guys to count the number of carbon atoms. Okay. You is it's traditional. Whenever you do these kind of questions, right, you must count the number of carbon atoms first. In this case, uh, guys, what kind of reaction has just happened? Our carbons have gone from three to four. What do we call this? Uh? Okay, what, what was this idea that we talked about just now? Okay, this is a step, step up. up reaction, right? Yes. Okay, so a step up reaction is where the number of carbons can increase. And in what scenario did we learn just now uh, that you can have a step up reaction? Hey, take note, uh, step up reaction must involve the CN minus nucleophile. So in other words, we can already anticipate uh, a CN going to appear in this pathway sooner or later. Okay, so if we take a look at what we started off with first, can we turn our bromine here into nitrile? We can, right? Because bromine can undergo nucleosub and you can turn this guy into a nitrile, right? So that's already one step, okay? So again, how do I know nitrile is involved? Uh, it's all because of the step-up reaction. So sometimes uh, if you see a step-up reaction, right, your life is actually easier because you know that there's only a nitrile that's possible, okay? Now once that is done, right, okay, then you must ask yourself, how do I turn a nitrile into this weird looking compound over here? Okay, remember, it can be seen as the reaction of a nitrile or the synthesis of an amine. Which one is more likely? Okay, so remember, reaction of nitrile is better because we learned that there are only three reactions of nitriles. Guys, what's this reaction here called? The first one is nucleosub. The second one is what? How do you turn a nitrile? into an amine. Reduction. Yes. So it's a reduction reaction. And that's the answer. Look. Now notice, uh, just now what, what I say is this, okay, if you all can't recognize. To reduce, uh, you add two H's to C and two H's to N, right? Okay, this is actually the same thing as this. You all realize? Yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, you just twist the molecule, then you get the one at the top. Okay. Reagents and conditions. Okay, let's use the new reagent that we learned just now. Lithium aluminum hydride in dry ether. And the first one, I remember, you want to substitute uh, CN minus, must use ethanolic NaCN and heat. Okay, all good. Huh? So, so far, our pathways are like three steps. Okay, I want you guys to try part D now. Actually, not D. Uh, let's see. Okay, I want you all to try part E. This one. Okay, part E. I'll give you guys a few minutes for this. This one, the pathway is a little bit longer. Okay, but again, you're starting with propene and you will end up with 2 methyl propanoic acid. Okay, so give it a try.
Okay, you all can ready or need more time? Yeah, just gonna go through this. Okay, so same thing like what I mentioned just now, right? You need to go and count the number of carbon atoms. Three to four carbons, there is a step up reaction. So guys, you can already envision the nitrile being somewhere in the middle of the pathway. Okay, so how do you get a nitrile? Okay, so remember what we mentioned just now, huh? your BR will turn into CN. That's the only way, right, that we have learned so far, right, to form a nitrile. We have never learned any other, any other way. Right. If you look at our previous question, we were already given a BR, so you can just turn it into CN very quickly. But here we're not even given this yet. Okay, but you notice uh, this reaction must appear somewhere in the middle. Okay, maybe it doesn't look exactly like this. Lah. Okay, but let's take a look first. Uh. We need to somehow turn the alkene into BR first, and then the BR turn into CN. Then later CN, we figure out how to turn into this guy. So by identifying this reaction, we have essentially split up our pathway into a few segments. Now our job is not to turn from this to this. Our job is to turn from this to this, and then to this, and then to a final compound. So it's a lot more segmented. What's the reaction here to turn an alkene into a BR? Okay, so. Electrophilic addition, right? Okay, so we know, right, that we need a PR, but where do we place the PR? The PR can be here or it can be down here. Okay, this is where we need to experiment. Lah. Okay, you can go and try and error, but you realize that only this one will work. But after this happens, okay, then the next thing we need to do is to turn it into CN. We know it must turn into CN because that's the only way to increase the number of carbon atoms. From there, can we turn CN into CO2H? <clears throat> What's this reaction called? Acidic okay. hydrolysis. Yes, acidic hydrolysis. Okay, try to note all the reaction names on top. So acidic hydrolysis. This one here is nucleo sub. And this one here is just your electrophilic addition. Okay, then with that said, you can just write down all your wages and conditions. So this pathway is a bit longer, but I hope you all realize it's a lot easier if you just identify the step-up reaction. Okay, so this is just HBr, gas. Okay, remember, electrophilic addition is usually room temperature. Okay, nucleus up. This is whatever we did just now. Ethanolic, KCN, heat. Then the final one is just acidic. So you use H2SO4 and it must heat. Uh, because hydrolysis, as I mentioned just now, is all about breaking of a bond using water. To break bonds, you need heat. Uh. Okay. There's also part D and part F that we never tried, but you can go and try this yourself. Okay, we've pretty much covered like the basics of reaction synthesis questions. Eventually, when you get very used to the reactions, uh, this kind of question is actually not very tough. For now, it seems tough, lah, of course, okay, because you all just started this. Okay, any further questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, right? Okay, that's the first half of the lesson done for today already. Okay, later I'll see you guys at 3.30 again. Okay, so you can we'll still use the same call. Uh, okay, but later just come back by 3 30 logo and take a break first. Yeah. Okay, and uh right, okay, see you guys later.